welcome to Slayer Fest 98. I'm your host, Ian Carlos Crawford, and joining me today is my lovely co-host, writer at Men's Health. Philip Ellis, hello. Hi, Philip. I was doing the math, and everyone has co-hosted, as of right now, I think everyone's co-hosted three episodes this season of all the co-hosts. Isn't that weird? That sounds right, though. I, I, I feel like I've done more co-hosting on this season than any other one. But also, like, it doesn't it doesn't feel weird because you took a big break. And obviously, we've been doing this sort of through the COVID times. So it's sort of been very, very spread out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, sorry, I interrupted you from introducing um, our guests. Yes, we have two fantastic guests uh, joining us to talk about this episode today. Uh, so first off, we have uh, managing editor at primetimer.com. Joe Reed. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Hi. Thanks for having me back. Of course. Uh, and we also have a uh, critic at large for Vox and co-creator of the podcast, Arden. Hey, it's me, Emily Vanderwerf. Hi, Emily. Hello. I, 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 we said this before recording, but I wanted to point out, when I emailed Emily to ask her to come on, she knew that Storyteller was the episode to come on for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that I, was like yeah. a few months ago, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. I think you like may have said the i don't remember if the finale was on the table at that point but i just was like let's do storyteller <laughs> um, yeah i mean it is a it is a uh standout season seven episode like i i don't remember all of them watching live but like i very much remember yes. watching this episode live yes. um yes but yeah so we're here to talk about storyteller but before we get into that emily it is your first time on the podcast give us your buffy origin story <laughs> Oh, gosh. Um, Buffy, I started the very first episode of Buffy I ever watched, to my recollection, was um, Innocence, the, the second half of the season two two-parter where Angel Wait, is, me too. is bad. That's so funny. <laughs> and That's I, like, so had, funny. I had no idea what was going on, but I knew I needed to see more of it. And uh, so I, I, I kind of started watching regularly there, becoming really tilted me over into huge massive fan and then i watched it until the end of the run i think there are still season one episodes i haven't seen because I, I circled back and watched it on dvd and just you know skipped over some uh, i found some watching guide or something um but yeah i i i watched it on all through its run it was hugely formative in the way i write uh, along with like a lot of other people around yeah. my age um for most of my uh 20s when i was doing writing fiction uh, even writing criticism, I was writing um, uh, Joss Whedon dialogue pastiche. I was doing like a Joss Whedon, Amy Sherman Palladino mashup, which I assure you was even more annoying than it sounds. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I just, this was one of the, this was my show. This was a thing where like uh, other people would say, you know, my favorite show is ER or whatever. And I'd be like, my favorite show is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> like I was very cool or something um, because I was, I was extremely cool. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I, I got my wife into it. Um, the first episode she watched was The Body. Oh, um, Jesus. Which she she uh, loved uh, and then was like chasing that high ever, <laughs> ever. But yeah, I don't know. I, I was super into Buffy for a long, long time. Um, and I still really love it. I was very happy to revisit this episode. Although the, the HD crop is bizarre. Um, yes. This is the first time I've watched these episodes in the widescreen crop. And it was... Very strange, but yeah, uh, I, I I love this show, and and I have issues with it now, obviously. But um, at its best, it's still you know terrific. You know, I I think about that a lot because, of course, during the seven seasons we've covered, we like will point out the like shit that doesn't quite uh, work now. Um, but I I do think of shows I love from what era. It holds up better than a lot of the other ones, I will say. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely, of course, there's, you know, a lot of stuff that yeah. does not hold up now. Um, but yeah, so we're here to talk about Storyteller. And this really is like a standout season seven episode. Yeah, I guess we'll we'll get right into it. So just this opening, I love. I love the Masterpiece Theater. Um, yeah. Tom Lank, I think, really sells this. What do you guys think? <laughs> Yeah, he's so funny in this. Episode. I had forgotten. I, 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 oh, he's 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 great. I'm I'm so glad that they gave him an opportunity to really kind of step centers into the center stage. Um, yeah. you know, just for one episode because obviously he was still such a relatively new addition to the cast. But I had forgotten 
the opening with the smoking jacket and the fireplace um, and it immediately put me in mind of um the south park episode where um they did great expectations yeah <laughs> i don't know if anyone remembers this and they have malcolm mcdowell reading charles dickens um in basically that room so immediately i was like i had a big smile on my face as soon as as soon as i hit play on the episode and also it was just so funny um, seeing Tom Lank basically giving us his best Moira Rose in the opening. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Saying vampire. Yeah. I uh, I, I can't believe, um, I mean, my brain went to uh, Mon- uh, Monster Peace Theater and Alistair Cookie, um, of course. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know. I think what I, I love about this episode is how it, um, it, it breaks open the conventions of storytelling, which I'm sure we'll talk about throughout. But I, I love any episode that just opens with a scene that's like, by the way, this is going to be a wildly different thing than what right. you're expecting. Right. And Buffy Buckle was in. so good at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's almost, I, and I mean, this might be an unpopular opinion, but it's almost like the Zeppo, but better because it has like a like gay nerd at the center rather than like Xander Harris. Yeah. Well, and and I think in, intentionally in a lot of ways it mirrors Superstar also yeah, because yeah. obviously Superstar was Jonathan's episode and this is Andrew's. And I think in general, anytime the show would kind of step out and do a spotlight episode on a character, those would, I mean, they obviously stand out. And I think in season seven, especially season seven is... I've revisited it the least of any, like I, you know, dip back into Buffy sort of constantly and hardly ever season seven for whatever reason. I, I, I have my issues with a lot of it, but like, it's not my least favorite, but still, and I'm sure you guys have talked about this as you've talked about the season as you've gone along, but like, there's a lot of sort of episodes that seem to be like block moving episodes (laughs) where you just sort of just like, we've got to like, we've got to set up this. And it almost feels like there are like signposts of like, they have to get from (laughs) conversations with dead people to lies. My parents told me. And in the middle, there's just like block moving and just sort of, we've got to introduce the Uber Mm -hmm. and we've got to do this with the potentials and we got to move Giles this way. And because of that, the episodes in season seven, that stand out to me are Anya's episode, selfless Mm. Andrew's episode, this one. And, um, and even just like, you know, the one where like Willow and Kennedy or like Willow becomes Warren for an episode or whatever. It's just like those ones that are, or even, uh, conversations with dead people, which is so structurally different also in, in a way sort of similar to this and kind of announces itself in that way too, where it's just like, this is not going to be your typical Buffy episode. This is going to stand out as being something different. And, or even like him is another one where it's just like him is just nothing like anything else that happens in the rest of the season. You could almost like skip it as you're watching the season and get the story, the actual like storyline all the way through, but it's so distinct and so fun and so yeah. uh, wonderful in the middle of it. And that's kind of what I story storyteller advances the plot more than that one does. But I, I, that's not why I like it. I don't like it because, you know, at the end they do something with the seal and like whatever the hell. It's just like I like it because Andrew's doing his thing and and it's wonderful. You're going to you're going to hate having me on this show because I don't ever like to just like follow the the normal whatever y'all do here like <laughs> so I'm just going to go on tangents the whole time. <laughs> go right ahead. Um, but I was I remember watching the first like third of this season and thinking it was like the, one of the best things the show had ever done. And mm-hmm. like, I, I now really love season six, but at the time I had some issues with it. And certainly it's more inconsistent than some of the other great seasons of the show. Um, but I remember watching the first nine now that I'm looking of this season and being like, yeah, this is, this is as good as this show has been. And then you enter, that's kind of the first act of the season. And then you enter act two, which is, setting up the end game and that is just very dry and very clunky mm-hmm. and there's just a lot of stuff in there that is not very good <laughs> and like it's 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 not like it's bad it's just boring and bland and like very interchangeable you know even Where the episode like, titles sound like they could all apply to the other episodes yeah. yes like, exactly you know, it- Right. Yeah. yeah. And like, you know, um, I think there's a pretty good one in there, which is um, uh, the one where Dawn thinks she might be a slayer. Like, I think that's that's pretty strong. Um, but yeah, it really storyteller begins act three. And I was looking at when it aired and I find it fascinating that it aired at the end of February sweeps. And then there was a month before new episodes. If yeah. you look at this as like 
this is the start of the end. And we're going to give a quick recap to viewers who may be rejoining us, but do it in a fun way. Yeah. Like that makes a lot more sense than, than where it ultimately aired. But like, yeah, this is really the start of the end of the series. And I don't think act three of this season is as strong as act one, but like there's, it is definitely, um, has a little more plot momentum. And I think that this episode, uh, like Joe said, is very fun, but also is, is introducing that new element of where the plot's going to go. I almost called it the last great episode of Buffy, but I, I do think the finale is great. So, um, but it's, <laughs> yes, it's Emily, good. thank yeah. you. I, we, we're talking about season seven. So many people like really hate the finale and I get the That's... like flaws and issues, but I still think it's a great finale overall. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's not the best episode of Buffy, right. but it is certainly, yeah. I don't know. It's a, it does everything I want a series finale to do, you know? In right. my experience, I think a lot of people's feelings on the finale are colored by the fates of certain characters yeah. who they were very invested in. And I get it. But no, I've always thought Chosen is a is a really strong series finale among like the universe of, you know, very people have a lot of opinions about series finales in a lot of different ways. And I think Buffy ends uh, as well as as most of the good ones. Yeah. I mean, they, they all should have died. I think we all agree on that. <laughs> uh, but. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's funny, Joe, you mentioned that there's a lot of block moving. So on my Patreon, I've been going through this season with my mom, who is a Buffy fan. Like, she's the one that got me into Buffy. But like, you know, she's 75. She's not doing rewatches of shit, right? So like, right, this is right. the first time she's rewatched it. There is a lot of her saying, who the hell is that? Wait, what the right. hell's going on? Because there's right. this, so many moving pieces in like especially the i mean emily you said the first act i i actually that will be my like hill i die on with buffy that the first act is it's fun it's good um yeah. but like especially the middle oh boy it's just like like yeah. first date and killer in me i forget that willow and kennedy's first date isn't in first date it's in right me and first date is buffy and robin wood's first date right uh, but yeah it's been a lot of my mom asking me who the hell's that what's going on and me having to like pause and explain before we can like actually discuss it for the patreon <laughs> well and so much of storyteller is jane espenson getting sort of carte blanche to satirize and sort of make fun of the season as it's happening like she had we have the moment where we're you know making a joke about all of Buffy's big speeches and in my head I'm just like but like Buffy just had a big speech like the previous episode probably and because it's going to have another like like this is we're I don't I don't know if there's enough distance from the things <laughs> that she's making fun of in this episode to like properly make fun of him even though it is really funny but there's the moment where he's going around the kitchen with the camcorder and just like this is Buffy and this is Spike and, sort of, and he's like this is I don't remember what her name is and it's <laughs> yeah. just like yeah that's kind of what this portion yeah. of the season has been it's just like <laughs> right there was another person who steal I don't remember at all I um, think it's that's a thing I really miss about the 22 episode broadcast TV season like that was a yeah. thing that that lost was also really good at lost would just be like oh right this is a thing you're thinking because we're thinking it in the writer's room and we're going to yeah. get out ahead of you and like writing the season as the season <laughs> airs sometimes like there's yeah. you'd get some interesting things because of that yeah yeah and like x files did that certainly like like it is a it is an artifact of a, a time in tv that i miss so like watching that i was like yeah they were in the room and they probably couldn't tell these characters apart and they were yep. realizing we wasted all this budget on all of these characters <laughs> who are interchangeable because yeah. one, one of the one of the famous things about um season seven is that um you know they wanted to bring back um seth green for the last few episodes yeah, right. and they just didn't have the money for it and you have to imagine at this point they were figuring out we can't do all we want in those final episodes because we spent all this money on these characters who are vaguely interchangeable a couple of yeah. them stand out because you know kennedy's dating willow and um right. And Sarah Hagen uh, is, you know, very dorky. Yeah, but yeah. like, yeah, I always want to call her Millie. And that's not her name. <laughs> of in this course, show. It's Freaks Amanda. And Geeks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Freaks and Geeks icon, Sarah Hagen. Yeah. <laughs> Wasn't the Seth Green thing that they wanted him to play the role that Azura Sky played in Conversations with Dead People? where he was going to be the conduit for terror or am I misremembering something? Uh, wait, I have a, I have actually a good answer for that because they, when I, cause I, you know, record with the season seven costume designer, Matt Van Dyne and yeah. recorded for that episode up until a week before they filmed the credit, the, the script was still Tara. So like, yeah. Oh, okay. That's must be to, cause his script that he had, like he saved a few of the scripts and his script 
which was dated like a week before filming, still had all of it as Tara. So I think up until the end, they probably were trying to get Amber Benson. And she was like, nope. And they probably were like, literally anyone we can get, please someone. And yeah, somebody who's on recently. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. Is Azura still doing anything? Yeah, totally. No, I I do. I like, I, I. I'm one of the first times when I was like, Joss Whedon was like my writing hero for a while. Sure. And one of the first times I was like, maybe this guy isn't, isn't <laughs> all he's, he, maybe he's kind of a, a, a shithead um, was when he gave this elaborate story of like what they had wanted to do this big Terra episode in the final season that where will like, Willow basically Willow gets a, a wish and the wish somehow brings back Tara and there's like a whole story in the last scene is Tara coming back to Will and it was going to be like episode 20 or something oh, wow. and and then he like shared this story and was like well but Amber Benson didn't want to do it and it was like framed as her being shitty and even at the time I was like you know what that's a that's a cool story and you could have just said but we couldn't right. make it work because of the money you know you like, didn't have to throw her under the yeah. bus like that exactly yeah. so um, yeah and when she was when Dana Pickley and I interviewed her. She was very polite about saying there were many reasons why she didn't come back. But most of all, she felt that would just be like too cruel for like the queer fans of Buffy to watch, you know, the beloved ex-girlfriend. Because like in the original script, it was Tara telling Willow to make sure she cuts up instead of across when she like, yeah, like definitely too much. Yeah. 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 Um, And I like, you know, of course, back then I was like, oh, that would have been cool. But as an adult, I'm like, I'm glad that wasn't Tara because that would yeah. have been. It would have just I dipped stupid. back into that episode today because of uh, because of the fact that they sort of re litigate that scene mm-hmm. uh, from that episode with Jonathan and Andrew. And I wanted to see how it played um, originally. And so I, of course, got sucked into all the other things that happened. <laughs> in this episode. So that's a wild episode. I forgot all the all the stuff that happens in that uh-huh. one. I, I, yeah, I, I, I love the way that they wrote that is there was, there was a, an episode of, of Arden that I won't reveal which one it is, but we, it's credited to a different writer and it ended up just being like the core team just rewrote it over a weekend and like yeah. had, d- took the conversations with dead people thing where we were like, okay, we're all going to take one scene and rewrite it in this specific yeah. way. And like, that has always been an inspiration to me personally. Um, but I, I gotta say as, as a, as a queer lady who is used to seeing stories where, um, queer ladies die at the end Mm. and honestly doesn't, doesn't hate that as a storytelling trope. Like I think it, it being the only trope kind of sucks, but I think sometimes it really works. If they had brought back Tara, if they had magically resurrected her in episode 20, as supposedly they were going to, I would have liked that. That would have been very yeah. nice. But yeah, bringing her back in conversations with dead people, I think would have been too much. Yeah. Yeah. And like, because it's already sad, right? It already like, Azura yeah. Sky is very right. good. And it already is yeah. like sad watching Willow cry. And I think if it was like her thinking she's actually, I don't know, just, yeah. Um, but anyway, so uh we get this like very wonderful intro of Andrew as uh, the masterpiece theater guy. And I do like that. They had this huge set. They like to set it up to look all nice and they only use it for like, what is it? Two minutes. Um, Cause then we get Anya yeah. knocking on the bathroom door and oh, it's not. yeah. Right. And I, I think this is like a very iconic season seven line of Anya saying like, why can't you masturbate like the rest of us? I love that. <laughs> I remember okay, at the time I, I that so aired. Good. Oh, Phillips, go, you go. I've talked too much. You, you I, I, no, I was to say I have so many notes on my phone from just that like one line of Buffy the Vampire Slayer as a show really loves a wanking joke, <laughs> um, and, and this is the last great wanking joke of the show. But like, I, I was just thinking of all the other ones, like you know, in Hush, where Buffy makes like the stabbing motion yeah, with the yeah. stake. Yeah. Um, and um, in Restless, when Xander's like, oh, uh, sometimes I think about two girls doing a spell together and then I do a spell by myself. Yeah. Um, and it, and it, it's just so funny because it, it's always been like so coy and kind of tongue in cheek. And then like they're like, oh no, this is season seven. We're all grown ups now. We're going right. to have people like banging it out throughout the rest of the season. We're just going to have a character say the word masturbate, and that's going to be the joke. And it just it works so well. And it's and yeah. then it, there's like a that weird awkward silence for two seconds before it then starts the credits, and it's just perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Emma, and Emma Emma Caulfield like it was so good at at that sort of delivery. Yeah, um, yeah. So 
Yeah, I mean, she like when we talk about because, of course, I do agree that Sarah Michelle Gellar was like very much overlooked, like she deserved an Emmy for her role as Buffy. I always think, but also Emma Caulfield, like, yeah, <laughs> her delivery of like every Anya line, like season seven after selfless, they don't quite know what to do with her. No, but yeah, boy, does she stand out in like, ev- you know, her like three scenes she gets where she delivers a quick line. She fucking nails it. She like stands yeah. out, even though they have her just like, you know, mostly just being like, what are we going to do now, Scoobies? And then deliver a funny line, but it always works. She's that. Well, this is sort of what I was talking about with that. It feels like there were like moments of demarcation for the season. And then we had to just get to those points. And that's what it felt like with Anya, where after selfless, they don't want to, you don't want to have her die in selfless. You want to have her, right? Yeah. you know, but they don't really have anything to do with her beyond like, well, we want to get to a point where she and Xander come to a, a moment of reconciliation. And in the middle of all of that, like expanse of like 10 episodes, there's really not a whole lot to do. And she ends up just sort of like being around the house for comic relief. And in a lot of ways, thank God, because there was a lot of like very yes. sort of serious uh, team assembling uh, moments and and glad Anya was there. Um, and then I'm glad Anya is there for the end game where she is very often the voice of resistance to what Buffy's doing. Uh, mm-hmm. But in this episode, what I loved about her in this episode is, and in very like, economical terms it sets up a rapport between her and andrew that pays yes. off uh towards the end of the of the season that i really love watching in retrospect because i don't know if even i would have recognized it at the time but i was like oh this is cool like they're sort of like there's a little bit of a if not a kinship that like there's a little bit of a connection between the two of them yeah. which well they're both outsiders yeah and, 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 and you're absolutely right, Jacob. This reminded me, um, I was like, oh, it's the fun wheelchair fight in this episode. Or I, and I didn't realize I was completely sort of skipping ahead. But the the one brief scene where um, Andrew kind of appeals to Anya's ego and says like, oh, well, you would bring some perspective and balance and, and glamour. Yeah. And she's like, well, yes, yes, I would. Um, <laughs> that just that like, you know, 10 second scene. I, I took that over. I will take that over all of the Xander bullshit we get later. Yeah. <laughs> I think that you know how the, how the amulet brings Spike back on Angel. Wouldn't it have mm-hmm. been wild if it brought back Anya instead? Yes. What if Anya just showed up <laughs> on Angel? <laughs> They're like, no, Spike's the one who died, even though he's like this absurdly popular character. We're bringing back fan favorite Anya, yep. and we're just tossing her in to Angel for no reason. <laughs> I would have loved this the last season of Angel so so much more if that was the case. I yeah, you know, Emily, you make a good case because like. I mean, Harmony was a very wonderful addition, but Anya there too would have been like, I I feel like Anya would have gotten into the vibe of like working in an office, right? Oh, very much so. Yeah, the (laughs) possibilities would have really opened up. Yeah. Yeah. And I really, I mean, I really love that final season of that show, but yes. I do too. Yeah. (laughs) I'm now picturing Anya and Harmony working at opposite desks like M. Emily and Andy in The Devil Wears Prada. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but okay, so so then we, so just to get back to this episode. So yes. then um, Andrew is then basically uh, filming in the kitchen and we get the incredible sort of soft focus intro to Buffy and to Spike and Anya um, eating grapes in the most erotic way for, like, ever. Um, and I just... All, yeah, all of that is is perfect. Chef's kiss, um, and then you know, sort of, they're talking about whether he should be recording or whether. Well, it, and it's it's like a very meta, pleased with itself scene where they're like, well, Buffy, maybe like what you're doing is important, and maybe like there should be a record of it. Wink, wink. This is the show, um, and yeah, I, I, I'd be interested to hear sort of like what you guys think of. Is that was that too meta? Was it too self indulgent, or did it work for you? I want to just be very clear. Nothing is ever too meta for me. Like I, I, <laughs> this episode could have opened with with Andrew saying, "Of course, you know I'm an actor named Tom Lank, and this is Sarah Michelle Geller." And then Buffy saying, "What are you talking about?" I would have liked it even more. So please, I'm going to let other people answer this question. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I it's it's funny, and it you know, and it works. I I found myself thinking as the sort of episode rolls on sort of what what the episode is trying to say about the you know stories we tell and Andrew specifically and why he's the one who sort of 
who Buffy gets so mad at for, you know, sort of mythologizing himself and, and through all of this, because I think one of the things that I think is really interesting about this episode is kind of really low key, which is everybody but Buffy seems to be pretty indulgent of Andrew by this yeah. point. Whereas yeah. like Willow is just like, just let him film. It's fine. And Xander sort of says the same thing. Spike is, goes along with him enough to like, film a scene yeah. you know <laughs> essentially as an actor in the scene um the one that i like the I best know, is he has a small little moment with dawn where you can yeah. see that's just like just give dawn some attention yes. she'll be so happy for it and he does that for her and he kind of for as much as xander sort of got a lot of the like shine for being like you're the one who sees everything Andrew does that in this episode kind of better than Xander ever does, where it's just like, he honestly, he sees every, he sees that Willow and Kennedy are sort of having a moment when nobody else really notices that. And he kind of sees the best in everybody, which is very sort of sweet and darling in this episode. A lot of Andrew's character in this episode does sometimes feel to me that just like, oh, we kind of like arrived at that out of nowhere. The fact that like Andrew is a storyteller is just like, has he been? Is that like <laughs> a thing? But it, within the episode, within just sort of the episode in and of itself, I think it re- works really well. I, I think you're uh, basically at this point in the show, Andrew is a better Xander than Xander in yeah. terms of, you know, as, <laughs> as you say, kind of be, being the, the human character with no powers who's sort of um, an outsider among all of these super, super powered, you know, other people. And also, like, you know, he's kind of the voice of the viewer and also the voice of the geeky viewer with all of yeah. his, like, niche nerd references and stuff. Because Z- Xander's had, Xander has so far departed from, you know, who he was at the beginning of the show. It's almost like we don't really need him. Also, just side note, when Andrew's like, yeah, Xander is the heart of the group. And he's like, oh, yeah, the heart. And it's like, oh, get over that, Xander. That was four years ago. And then you left your fiance at the fucking altar. So <laughs> you're know, not that special. <laughs> um I, but but you but you are also right in that um, the storyteller thing kind of comes out of nowhere. But I I think maybe it's just because they were like, oh well, in season six, like the trio were constantly like talking about movies and and comic books and stuff. So I guess here is a character who would be very aware of tropes and genre and cliches that, and the way that he's constantly like framing and reframing his own narrative. Um, even though it's a bit of a leap, I think it does make sense. I think Andrew is not so ambiguously coded queer. Um, (laughs) And uh, I think a a thing about as as a queer person who used to try to exist in those male dominated nerd spaces, there is a kind of thing you do where you detach and you like make yourself a little bit distant and you sort of treat it like a story you're you're telling to yourself. I doubt that's what Jane Espenson was thinking about when she wrote this script, (laughs) but it rang true to me as like, I don't know. I would always sort of imagine myself as like a TV character in a weird way and then be like, well, you know, of course, this is all just fictional and we're all just having a good time because I just couldn't quite comprehend what was happening or why. So um, uh, it it rang true to me on that level as as sort of a, a queer metaphor. You imagine yourself in these TV spaces, but not as the main character, but as yes. somebody who really supports and appreciates the main character. Like, yes. yeah, that's absolutely. really accurate. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, I would be so good of a friend to Buffy if I were on Buffy, like that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I'm the I'm I'm the girl who read Great Gatsby and was like Nick Carraway. That's me. Yes, right, exactly. Emily, <laughs> Jesus. Wow. <laughs> but um, so I, I want to talk about the. I know we've kind of already gone past. It, but I want to talk. I love his like telenovela intros for them. That like makes me very happy with like Buffy with her hair flowing. Um, I know that you already mentioned it was like maybe too meta, but I so we get that. But I got to talk about when he when he says time to introduce everyone, and Amanda says I'm Amanda, and he goes no 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 not you sweetheart like yeah. I have to let- <laughs> <laughs> and he. Like grimaces, yeah. like, always looks at the camera and like oh, this is this is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> like I just I needed to talk about that because I just love him being like no 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 not you. Even <laughs> she's the potential we've actually met and the girl he ends up on where he's like and you I don't remember your name like she's just a rando. Um, but so yeah so we get more of the like like you said Philip it's very meta this episode more so than most Buffy stuff I guess. Um, but I'm going to go with you, Emily. I 
as someone who watched and loved Scream Thursday night and is going to see it again after this recording, I, I love a meta. Like, I just do. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a theory that Buffy doesn't want to be filmed because then, like, she's going to get cancelled and called a Karen or something. Because <laughs> literally, like, there's a, there's, there's a man walking around this house with a video camera and she is literally talking shit about a girl who killed herself five minutes ago last week. Um, it's like she, everyone's like, she is basically like terrorizing a lot of teenage girls and is like a really bad friend and te- like neglecting her sister for whom she is the legal caregiver. Um, and she's like, yeah, I don't want any of this on, on tape. <laughs> the camera is dead ass. I, I just feel like Buffy is just, uh, this is almost like I, Andrew is like gay Twitter, pre gay Twitter. Andrew is like, doing like (laughs) youtuber thing before that was i I don't think youtube was a thing back no it wasn't i don't know i i like you know season six we talked about this a lot philip how like the the trio were like those incel online bros before there was like the online before that was a thing of like you know uh yeah i think david vass just said it best they are the guys that would have review bombed captain marvel before it even came out just for her existing as a woman who's right and like the kind of predated that, right? Because that, that didn't exist then. And I feel like Andrew kind of is like a precursor to that kind of like person who's like, you know, and and you know, no, there's no shade there because I am extremely online. Most of us are extremely online. So right. <laughs> now what's what's the internet? What's <laughs> what's a what's a podcast? Someone could explain. Um, uh, no, I I think um uh, I do think that it also is interesting that it allows the show to play around with found footage horror, yeah. which is at this time just starting to be a thing. Um, Blair Witch is 1999. This episode's 2003. So, you know, there, there's a cool little gap there. And like, it doesn't like do anything revolutionary with that, but it certainly is a new visual style for the show to play around with. I did have a thought that if this episode takes place even like a few years later, that it might have been like an actual mockumentary style, like uh, format I, switch. I wondered why. I kind of wondered why they didn't do that. It, it, yeah. Have you ever seen the X Files episode X Cops, which is literally an episode of Cops set within the X Files? Oh but yes, yes. I, I wonder why that. they didn't just do something like that here, where yeah. it was like more of a reality TV found footage horror thing. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I forgot about that X-Files episode, but you're right. So, wait, Philip, where are we in the episode? Oh, we're at Andrew is giving more of his, like, talking to the camera, right? Yes. Oh, yes. So he, uh, one of my favorite little bits is um, he leaves the room to skip Buffy's speech. He's like, oh, she's going to go on for a while, so let me just catch you up. And, <laughs> which is just like, it's so funny. And, and, and that's very much the show responding to itself, as, um, as Emily already mentioned. And he's giving his, he's editorializing. He's giving yes. his very edited version of his history where he was the leader of the trio. And, oh, like, yeah, Willow, uh, Willow has darkness in it. I, I remember that. And and then he kind of, like, gives a re- very revised version of um, his that encounter with Willow. so funny. The, the way, <laughs> where they just where he edit him into that, that scene. One. It's so funny. Yes, great. yes. yes. <laughs> and it's like, I was like, I, I was like, this is, this is why you have a character like Andrew doing this, because he is the nerd character who would be so aware of fantasy tropes and cliches. I am sure that I read at least three, like, doorstopper novels in my teens where a magician or a sorcerer calls, like, their apprentice little one. And it's yeah. such, like, a gross, <laughs> sexist, like, weirdly infantilizing thing. It's like, if you had said little one to Dark Willow, she would have skinned you alive. So, like, yeah. let's, look, let's look at this. There's such, a, there's such a Dungeons and Dragons vibe to that scene, too. It's just, like, they just keep rolling having great roles so yeah uh, yeah Yeah, and i do i mean we kind of mentioned it before but i love that he when he pads and he's like even willow's bored she usually can handle all this and we see willow yawning and then we see yeah her and kennedy are good it does the the thing that the season does which i i don't always love is that it moves the pieces to like create a conflict that like last one episode and i'm like right I don't need like, you know it was literally just the end of the last episode that willow and kennedy had their conflict and the way it's wrapped up is, oh, look, they're holding hands. They're fine. And, and it's Andrew telling you to. Yeah. It's just like Andrew saying, like, don't worry. Like, they got past it. They had a couple good days. And it's just like, okay, apparently we're here now. All right, that's fine. <laughs> um, and I also, I also, I also, 
It did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I do also love that what she's telling them is what she learned in the last episode. So we don't even see her telling them. It's Andrew walks out as she's like, I saw this vision of all these Uber vamps. And he's just like, meh, I'm bored. Let's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I do, I enjoy that because that's a good economy of storytelling yes. because we've only got so many episodes before the finale. The viewer already knows this. We also have her like reiterate it to Principal Wood later in the episode. Right. Um, so it's like, we don't need to, we don't need to hear Buffy doing, yes. doing another speech. Let's have fun with it. And, and I, I would much rather have, yeah, like Andrew's little, you know, sort of um, reveries. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the speech winds up. He's like, oh, yeah, she's, she's finished now. I think that that's probably means she's late for work. Um, <laughs> and then we get to the high school where basically we are treated to the greatest hits of the Hellmouth, um, <laughs> which is I had of... forgotten that. I was, I was so delighted by <laughs> yeah. being reminded that that was the thing where... Uh, <laughs> our tribute to Clea Duvall that we uh, revisit the, the invisible girl who doesn't get uh, paid attention to. And yeah, I thought that was great. And also, I mean, who among us would not be delighted if Sarah Michelle Gellar slapped us in the face? <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. I would be like, oh, you, you, you cured it. I'm fine now. Like, yeah. I'm having, I'm having a reverie right now about that idea. This <laughs> no. um, uh, yeah. I, I, one of the things I think this season does really well is sort of the back to the big, back to the beginning thing um yes, this whole yeah. season is very good at calling back to the roots of the show in interesting ways i do think it's kind of weird that buffy's a guidance counselor and i do yes. think it's kind of weird the degree to which these adults are just like beating up teenagers <laughs> but you know what it's fine it's fine <laughs> <laughs> she's like max maximum 21 years old at this point right like there's no way i was trying i was just doing the math of just like well she graduated high school at the end of three i think i so. did the math and she's she would be at this point because her birthday's in january she would be 22 i think she's okay. she's she but uh buffy and i are the same age she was okay. born six weeks after me so she would be 22 yeah there okay. we go okay yeah emily that's funny my birthday is two days after buffy's birthday in hey. the show so look at us hey there we go <laughs> yeah <laughs> i always when the show aired i would always be like well her epi her birthday episodes always air around my birthday and when she says she's Capricorn cusp of Aquarius. I'm Aquarius cusp of Capricorn, but nice. the 21st is sometimes like, depending on what astrology book you look at is the last day of Capricorn, not the first day of Aquarius. So like in my brain, I always was like, her birthday's the 21st, but then like fans did whatever math and it was the 19th, but I'll take it. It's close enough. <laughs> Buffy really was the rare television show that recognized its characters, birthdays and like was consistent about it. You really were able yeah. to kind of map a lot of do your own sort of like fan uh, mapping mm -hmm. of the show around the fact that you knew when Buffy's birthday was. I remember that being like a very like key piece of a lot of puzzles. Yeah. 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 Um, so we, yeah, we, we get the Hellmouth greatest hits. Um, her and her and uh, Principal Wood kind of like have their talk. He was hitting the head with a rock. And as they're talking, the kid that said he was going to explode, explodes outside their office <laughs> this is how you can tell this this episode is just buffy as the sitcom which they yeah. occasionally do like like joe you mentioned him earlier where they're like we're just going to be super silly yeah with it up until at the end when, when stuff gets serious but um yeah she's like oh yeah a, a child just died and buffy's like should have gone for a foot rub um and it's like that's really poor taste but also i laughed <laughs> <laughs> well and it's um, one of those things that has always like, been the case on buffy where it's just like well we live on the hell mouth so like these things happen and then like everybody just sort of like takes it in stride a little bit and it's just like oh okay like there we are yeah and also yeah yeah it's, it's like buffy's been doing this for seven years she's like well you've yeah. never seen a man explode before okay virgin <laughs> um so yeah so i i do think though that this scene like they're still very much pretending that buffy Buffy and Robin have chemistry when I don't believe that they do, even though he is a beautiful man. Very, um, yes. It's just, and, 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 and by the end of that episode, I, I think it's basically, they, they decide that's moot. They're like, oh, we're bringing Faith back soon. That's a much better fit. Also, I think right. the minute he calls her, oh God, what is it? He calls her a, a filthy whore or something when he's like, oh, possessed. when he's possessed. Like, okay, by that's the, the moment yeah. that, like, 
Yeah. yeah. That that's the moment that that flirtation is dead. Like, <laughs> okay. I don't I, I, unless unless it's in a very consensual and like hot sexual encounter. I, I think right. someone calling you a filthy whore is not gonna be eternal. <laughs> I like that you mentioned that they're like they're bringing faith in the next episode or within the next couple episodes, and it's just like having trouble with chemistry. We've got the solution. We're bringing faith back. It'll be fine. Like it's just instant chemistry in a can. It's uh, it's faith. Yeah. Seriously. Um, so we come back to the house. We get what you guys talked about. The the very cute. He really does. He is very cute about Dawn. He calls her like a uh, like you know everyday American teenager and bubbly and stuff. And she's just kind of like hi, um, which I think is very cute. And he like it's makes a joke cute. about she used to be a key, whatever that means. Um, I do appreciate the key jokes. This is like the second one we've gotten this season. Cause when I, I was, I was, when I was rewatching with my mom, she even said to me, wait, Dawn was a key, right? But she didn't have powers. Did she? And I was like, no, no, she didn't have powers. She was like, but she could open like portals. I was like, no, just that one time, just with her blood. Yeah. <laughs> then we moved past it. It was more of a passive thing really yeah. than an active thing. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense though, that Andrew wouldn't understand that because he was around in season five so he's okay. like obviously it was a major thing in everyone's lives um and he's like oh yeah so like this is there's this thing that like buffy and willow keep like mentioning that you're a key like what is that i don't i, I don't really I, I don't really understand it and i don't care to ask for an explanation <laughs> um we're just gonna move on and i like that but you think that andrew hasn't met joel gray they've absolutely met and hung <laughs> out and chatted about a lot of stuff <laughs> and it doesn't matter that Joel Gray died. I know that Andrew has been visited by, there's obviously a Christmas Carol episode of this where Andrew's visited by three spirits and one of them is Joel Gray and they just have a chat. <laughs> it is always wild to remember that Joel Gray was in what, two episodes of Buffy? Two season episodes, five. two incredibly pivotal episodes of Buffy. Yes. <laughs> While he I was doing his little era of showing up on all of my favorite television shows at the moments where favorite characters of mine died. Yes, that was he. He showed up on Buffy and Oz and Alias within like a year of each other. And in all of them, I'm pretty sure they were all episodes where either he killed somebody I loved or like somebody I loved died in that episode. I was just like, damn it. He's back. Bring Joel Gray but back. Only on Buffy did he have a sale. <laughs> That's, <all> that <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, I'm just assuming um, he didn't have a tail in the other ones, right, Joe? Yeah. Well, yeah, no, yeah, I think you're I think you'd safe assumption. Yes. <laughs> Philip. Um, so then we have uh, one of my favorite little moments of the episode. So uh, Andrew is interviewing Xander and Anya, and he basically it's like one of those gotcha interviews where he's like, Xander, you left Anya at the altar exactly one year ago today. Would you care to speak to that? <laughs> and my it's notes, like, my notes say so he in Cohen who. <laughs> <laughs> Like, I love that that's a, literally the first thing he says. He's like, so what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> you know, a thing that I will say about this, though, uh, I don't know what we're what we're trying to say with Xander and Anya here. Joe, I'd uh, be curious. What do you think? About Xander and Anya's whole deal in this episode? Yeah, yeah. I think... I think there was a lot of ambivalence on the show's part this season as to whether they wanted them to end up back together again or not. Yeah. And for whatever reason there was just ambivalence, just like sometimes it seemed like the show was moving them towards a reconciliation. And for whatever reason, a consistent POV on this show was, we don't want to give them too neat and tidy of an ending. I think that's why they never ended up getting married. And I think that's why, you know, Anya sort of backslid into, you know, her demon days for a while. And I think there was this sense of if we just let them get married, they're going to get too boring and, and we don't want that. And again, I think they wanted to have some kind of reconciliation before the end of the episode without it being like, well, we're back together. So this episode, I think was a nod towards everybody who was just like, but those characters really do love each other. We haven't, you've, you've not convinced us enough that they shouldn't be together. And this episode I think was a bit of a nod to, there's a, you know, this is a fan service episode in a lot of ways um, and not in a negative way. Yeah. But um, I think that's a lot of that is just sort of just like, yes, you're right. You know, Xander and Anya still do have something and we're going to sort of give that in this episode without pulling the trigger on while well, they're back together. Cause they didn't want to do that for whatever reason. As, as someone who got married at 22 
and is still with that woman. And it was a terrible idea. I think that <laughs> the Xander Anya relationship is a really smart portrayal of two people who belong together, but are just too like have met at too young of a point to get to the point where they're like mature enough to be together. But yeah, once the show breaks them up, it doesn't know how to develop that story, even though it's the right storytelling impulse, because it just doesn't have the narrative room for it. Cause it introduces 25 new characters this season. (laughs) So (laughs) cause yeah, I, you know, I, I understand the like Xander hate and most of it I agree with, but I, I, always felt they did him a bigger disservice by having him leave her at the altar because then as characters made sense, but I guess you are right, Emily. You do have to remember that, especially it was, so. There may be twenty two this season, right? So a year ago they were twenty one slash twenty. Like, uh, well, she's but, thousands of years yeah, old. On is, yeah, <laughs> true, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's its own true. kind of problem because when you when you're immortal, it just loops back around at some point, right? Right. right. Yes. Yeah, some some people when they argue about like. Well, Angel was like hundreds of years old and Buffy was, I'm like, all right, but like. Yeah, where were the licorice pizza then when Anya, <laughs> licorice pizza people then when Anya was seducing a just out of high school Xander? I mean, oh my God. <laughs> but I do think you're right, Emily. Like when you're immortal, it's like, yeah, kind of just, I don't know. And also that's like complete fiction, right? So I'm willing to be like, whatever. Let's people just do, Let's just do some age gap discourse right now. Yes, uh, right let's, now. Yeah. Here we Nothing go. we love better than that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, um, I remember loving because like when I watched this episode and I do remember this episode pretty vividly, you know, they didn't ever say he was gay, but like, of course he is. Um, but I remember being like, aha, look, he's definitely gay when they like pan to him being like, oh, you really want to see this? And it's Willow and Kennedy making out, but he's like, look at the window. Xander did such a good yeah. job. <laughs> Me thinking that was like very so cool. funny. <laughs> There's a, there is a bit where he calls, I think Jonathan cute. And it yes. is yes. It's sort of framed as Isn't unrequited he the cutest thing? crush. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. You're right. When, when he's talking about before he gets to the dark Willow bit, he's like talking about them as super villains. And yeah, he like, Describes Warren as the best and then Jonathan as the cutest. I actually yeah. took that as like, oh, that's the friend he didn't want to fuck. Like he just like would like loved him like a little brother. But sure. Warren, because he says is the best, is like he actually, you know, isn't saying, God, he's hot because that's what he wants to say. And like because he doesn't want to fuck Jonathan, he can say, like, oh, he's cute. Um, it's a bummer that all Warren ever wanted was sexual control over a woman, and that's what made him so disgusting. And yet he ended up purely by his own accident having some sort of you know romantic control over war of over uh andrew and that bums me out that yeah. warren was able yeah. to achieve that even in yeah. uh post post death form <laughs> i was i was gonna say that um I judge Andrew if indeed he does have a crush on Warren because Warren is a horrible person, but who's still amongst? Right. I mean, honestly. Exactly. <laughs> We've all had our problematic crushes. So <laughs> this is this is the thing that happens. <laughs> yeah, I am I am definitely not one to talk about someone's taste in uh partners <laughs> or crushes, because you know, hands up, I'm guilty. <laughs> um, and you know, I haven't even watched you, but I everyone thinks that guy's hot, right? <laughs> He's very hot. He's very He's hot. like Okay. stalker serial killer so you know eh. i also do love that is it here no it's a little bit later that he like secret filmed them and he's like melding the words um so we oh, come- that, that when he's like lip syncing along and then he's like got tears in his eyes it's yeah. like oh you're what that was me like watching buffy as a teenager and like <laughs> right. I, I'd, be, I'd be pretending to be buffy and then like, I pretend that Angel was telling me that he loved me. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of getting to age gap discourse, we're just going to get into our uh, queer trauma, Emily. <laughs> hey, okay, so let's clear out the next 25 minutes. And, um... <laughs> um, yeah, and so we get we get that, which I do love. Um, but we before we get that, it's Buffy and uh, Robin Wood, and she's like telling him about like her vision. And I do love that he says, why do any of you trust each other? You've all been evil at some point. Um, Robin touches the seal. He gives the line you mentioned. Buffy knocks him out. And then she's like, oh, there's one person that knows about the seal. And I do love the babe, the like pig runs by, the one that he called babe. Yes. And was like, I hope it's not a student. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so here we cut back and we get 
the spike scene, which I love because we don't get a lot of spiked in this episode, but that feels also very spiked. Like people forget because I will say, you know, being a mostly Buffy podcast that is very extremely online, people get very, very precious about Spike. And sometimes they often forget that like his whole like punk rock act is mostly an act, right? Like yeah. he's actually like a very sensitive poet. Um, and so I just love the idea of him being like, oh, get out of that, get that camera out of my face. And Andrew being like, oh, your light was off, redo it. And him being like, okay. And then immediately going back to one and yeah. like doing the bit again. I took it as a quasi callback to Restless too, where uh, mm -hmm. oh, there's a moment in Restless yeah. where he's doing like a photo shoot or whatever. And that's what, that that reminded me a lot of that. And there's another callback to Restless in this in the uh, one uh, moment yeah. where Andrew and Jonathan are having the like the shared dream of all the little flashes of of the seal and whatever. And they interstitial there a uh, a shot of the cheese man yeah. a couple of <laughs> times. And it's like, oh, that's cute. That's fun. <laughs> I, I was I was going to say the same thing that like I I the the, the rest of this thing absolutely uh, but also you're you're so right Ian like Spike is just the biggest poser yeah um, like when he when we first see him in this episode he walks into the kitchen he's like oh it's like a bloody girls dorm in here and it's like no shit Spike like <laughs> what, where have you been all season like of course yeah there are lots of there are lots of girls their potentials like welcome um <laughs> and it's like almost you, you you almost know it's like like he's very again and like just relating everything to being gay it's like I don't want to hang out with like the boys and do sports I want to go to like Buffy's house and just like braid like the, the potential slayer's hair and like talk about boys <laughs> <laughs> you know that deep down he's like oh yeah he's like oh yeah oh my god like there's so many girls around here this sucks and he's like oh this is fun <laughs> I just I just I wish you know if if they let me reboot Buffy which obviously they should um uh I I really would love if there was like if one of the potentials was like like an egg which is um a pre pre-transition trans woman um so it's just like this random teenager who thinks she's a boy and it's like wait why am i a vampire slayer <laughs> that's what i would do Emily. <laughs> um i would be here for that <laughs> i was gonna say would watch would yeah. get obsessed with yeah totally. i mean uh, anya said it best oh no, no no oh my god no it was andrew in the episode so potentially he's like, oh yeah, it's almost like a, a great metaphor for womanhood, being a potential, being a slayer. It's like, there you go. It's in the text already. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And Emily, when you get that job though, I'd appreciate it if you could hire me as a staff writer. Okay, absolutely. <laughs> right. uh, we'll we'll do that. We'll do that. Um, there's there's actually the um my my wife and I do some script writing, and and one of them is we literally pitch it as this is trans Buffy. So um, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it's happening. <laughs> um, so we. Then we get the, I got to point out the line because when he's reciting Anya's lines, I, it's such a weird, I think about this line a lot because I think about it when I'm like having arguments with people where, where Anya says, here's where we hop on the merry-go-round of rotating knives. I blame you, you blame me. And we're all left cut to shreds. I think it's like such a good line about fighting. And I think about that a lot when I like argue with someone or if I'm like getting mad at someone and I'm like, well, don't want to do the cut the shreds thing. Like I just, I don't know. I think it's a very good Anya line and very insightful. Oh, I, I, it is. I, um, I'm the opposite. I just thought, oh, some writer was so pleased with that line. It's so <laughs> emo, but it, it fits so perfectly into an episode all about the stories we tell about ourselves. Yeah. Like Anya has had that in her notes app for six months and she's just been waiting for the perfect moment to whip it out. <laughs> she, she knew it would be with Xander too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. She's not wasting that shit on Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we then with then Robin and Buffy come busting in uh to tell Andrew they need his help. And so then we cut to flashback the Andrew Jonathan one. We learn it's Willow doing a memory spell with this thing that looks like one of those rock salt lamps. Um, yes, exactly. I, I love Andrew saying, like, I document, I don't participate. I'm a journalist. I'm, you know, in the, I'm not like one of the people that partakes. And I just love him, like, 
<laughs> trying to take himself seriously when he's not. And Buffy- I would have loved the idea if, because in this episode, there's a lot of like, we're going to make Andrew think that something is true, even though it's not just right. to manipulate him into doing what it has to be done. I would have loved if we had seen a little moment where Will is like, we need to think and get him to think like he's staring into a charm. What looks like a charm? And she just sort of walks into Kennedy's room and she's got like a salt lamp or whatever. She's just like <laughs> that, that'll do. That's perfect. <laughs> I like, I realize that we're going through the plot of this episode beat by beat, but as you're describing it, I'm just, like this episode has like no plot it is <laughs> it has a plot but the plot is mostly nonsensical it's there to hang yes. jokes off and like yeah that's what i love about it but as you're describing i'm like wait is this episode secretly bad <laughs> <laughs> yes that the, by the time we get to the episode i'm like it's about him crying that i'm just like what and it's like yeah there's that is Yes, there's a way to read this episode as bad, even though I choose not to. I, you know, I think this episode is fantastic. And like the yeah. structure of it is actually pretty functional when you boil down into it. It's just like, at this point, the like fantasy mumbo jumbo of the series was so. Yes. Yes. It was just they had so. They gone through all of the overrun. good horror stories. And now yeah. there's just like, well, we've got to end it. So <laughs> our horror story this season is ending the show. I just really, I really think it really felt to me, and nobody's ever confirmed this to me, but it really felt to me that they absolutely were setting up the final villain to be an evil incarnation of Buffy that the yeah. regular Buffy would have to fight. And somebody balked at that idea at some point. And that's just a much more powerful metaphor for entering your twenties than, you know, what they came up with, which is fighting a guy in a priest outfit. And like, I like right. Caleb and I think Nathan Fillion is, is good in that role, but um, you know, Buffy fights Satan should have an element of metaphor to it that it just doesn't have. Yeah. Yeah. I think I, I agree with that. I mean, Joe, you did say this is a season where they're kind of like, nope, no more like metaphors, no more just straight up saying what it is. Or maybe you said that, Philip, but Emily, I will say no one has ever said to me before on the podcast, Ian, you described me this episode as making me think it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, and, uh, no, I just, I think um, uh, that may just be like, I, no, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. When, when, when you start like just describing the plot of something, I'm like, wait, does that make sense? <laughs> like, and that's, I have that with like the fucking Godfather, you know, like I'm <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but uh, also you're, Oh, not wrong, Joe. The conceit of it really is like Andrew cries. Um, mm -hmm. Right. But for me, it's a good thing know. he cries in a way where it like the cheers are really gloopy and drippy or else it wouldn't have worked at all. If he was one <laughs> of those people who cry like very demurely, like it, it would have really backfired on him. I think Buffy would have just picked him up and just like held him over right. the, <laughs> like, like a salt shaker. And just, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you probably would have enjoyed that even better than just sort of holding them over the over the seal. She would have gotten a little catharsis out of it. <laughs> yeah, she probably would have. Or just like um, punch him in the nose so that his eyes start streaming. Or just pluck she some nose that. hairs out or something. Just like something that you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And so just give him give him a really bad paper cut. Just like <laughs> have him watch, him have him watch the body, and just yeah. kind of really want to get into meta. Oh, just that like would be him, so good! Show that him the body, so and just have him just weeping and weeping, and yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, go ahead. So back to this Mexico flashback. Um, yeah. So I love that uh, Jonathan and Andrew are sleeping in the same bed, like Bert and Ernie. It's just adorable, yet, oh, like Bert and Ernie. Exactly. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Just everything about it, like you know, Jonathan having a shy bladder and being like, "Don't talk to me" when he's trying to pee. Like it's just like it is very. Oh, this could be a sitcom about like a really nerdy gay couple. Like I'm, I'm into it. And then just obviously that we live as gods interludes. Fucking fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I was gonna say we gotta mention that because it's so silly. And like it's the most numfar do the dance of joy moment of Buffy. Like after yeah. Angel did that whole thing in in its second season, uh, where I was just like, when when are we gonna get that moment in Buffy? And it's that it's a uh, pastoral musical extravaganza. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah. So we then they're like, all right, we gotta bring him to the seal. Uh, I was wondering like how much time has passed since they left school because it is. We just saw school like 10 minutes ago. and it That was, made uh, me laugh so much. And I think that was intentional where yeah. all of a sudden it was just like, we just left school and now all of a sudden it's the warriors just happening inside yes. Sunnydale High. <laughs> um, also, 
I, I know I had when, you know, when the high schoolers kind of start um, showing up and fighting them, I was like, why? They, like, and, and it's kind of goes back to um, the point that somebody made earlier about like, oh, they're fully just like beating up kids. It's like, no, no, these high schoolers are very obviously 40 year olds. <laughs> yeah. Also that. Yeah. <laughs> Then Buffy and Andrew go down to the basement and we get the Rashomon style retelling and retelling of how he killed Jonathan and he keeps trying to like elude the, the responsibility. Um, and, and, that, and that kind of just like then leads us into, you know, kind of what the theme of the episode is Andrew telling stories and kind of just treating it all like, like characters and, and, and it's out of his control. Um, but I'm always a sucker for... Uh, a, a kind of a Rashomon device um and uh, it, even like uh back in the the Mexico flashback when he's like uh, oh no it's it's relevant because then Jonathan had to pee and then Jonathan says I have to pee yeah I, I love it when like the, the narrator and then the action are very much like commenting on upon each other yeah. um so yeah that 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 was not too meta for me I I, I've, I really just loved all of that uh Philip I'm gonna be the dum-dum in the room what is it that you're referencing? Rashomon, what? Rashomon, so it's a Japanese movie um, from, oh, I, I don't know, some, like mid, maybe 40s. I think 40s, it's, 50s. I think it's 1950, 1951, something like that. I think like around that. there, yes. Yeah. So uh, black and white Japanese movie, uh, basically it's just retelling the event of, uh, I believe it's a death in a clearing, um, but told from three different perspectives and each, narrator tells the story a completely different way um so that basically like it's it, 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 it's just it and it, it basically it originated this trope of like unreliable narrators tv shows will pull this all the time yeah. like I was you, say, once I, you know the yeah. trope like you see it all yeah. the time it's yeah. uh yeah it is indeed from 1950 it was um akira kurosawa's breakthrough film on the international yes. stage um he won the oscar for it well japan won the oscar for it i'm right. so sorry joe um, <laughs> <laughs> don't misstep around joe with that thank you for acknowledging my uh my presence as the oscar dork of this particular panel yes yeah. um yeah the first thing that came to my mind i know this is like very stupid but and i i defend it all the time that, that i didn't watch season two but season one of punisher is actually very good and i don't normally love a guy with guns as a hero um but they have an episode that's based completely around that where everyone's telling the story and like yeah. the pit, like everything's told differently every time. And I think it's like one of the best episodes of any of the Marvel Netflix shows. So we, we get that uh, we cut back to Xander and Anya have now our post sex in Spike's Spike's basement bed, which I don't imagine is comfortable to lay in, let alone have sex in, but good for them. Um, and I like the line of Xander saying, I feel good. And Anya saying, well, yeah, I'm a spitfire in the bedroom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and they kind of, I mean, y'all are right because you said it before, but like here it's like, oh, it was one last thing. Oh, was it one last thing? And it's almost like they're wrapping it up. But then we know that they do like hook up later, like towards the end. Um, so, yeah, I never... Yeah, I, I go back and forth because I, I kind of want them to get just like be like, yeah, we'll get together. But I guess also for the ending, it might have been too sad if they were like, yeah, let's go forward. Let's get married. And then Anya fucking dies. Um, Nothing was going to make that less sad, Ian. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, but so then we cut Buffy's fighting the newly bringerized students that they find around the seal. Um, she beats them up. And I can remember actually when watching this because... Buffy consistently could not stand Andrew. Like there was never a point when yeah. she was like soft on him or right. like sweet with him that I was like, oh, maybe she is going to stab him. Like I thought she wasn't going to kill him, but like if she needed to close the seal and the only way was to stab him, I kind of was like, maybe she will stab him. Like I didn't think she'd kill him, but I thought she would like do that for the greater good, so to speak. Right. I don't know. What, right. what, Sacrifice a pinky for the good. Right. Of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Emily. I was going to ask. Speaking of age gap discourse, um, <laughs> watching watching Buffy beat up a bunch of high schoolers um, made me wonder, how old is Kennedy supposed to be? And maybe okay. you've talked about this. We have. But... <laughs> I think in like almost like every episode, someone brings us up because the potentials are supposed to be around like 16. But Kennedy does have a line saying she's the oldest where she thought she wouldn't be a slayer anymore because she was too old. So okay. like 
the assumption here is that she's like 19. And so like Willow's 21, maybe 22. So like, okay, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, there is like a throwaway line in one of the episodes where Kennedy says she thought she was too old to even be called anymore. Yeah. Okay. Well, um. thank you for that. Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Um, Sparing us that conversation. Yeah. Now Willow's 25 and Kennedy's 15, right? And this, this whole season is a picaresque journey through their lives in, in the Valley of, right. of Southern California. Yeah. I love that episode where they sell waterbeds together. It's really, it's very fun. <laughs> Emily, what did you feel about Buffy threatening Andrew? I mean, I, I think it's a, uh, I, I was of two minds about it. I think it's a, a powerful sequence. I think the acting is good. I think the way yeah. that Jonathan breaks down and admits, or, <laughs> I think the way that Andrew breaks Andrew, down yeah. and admits what he did is really good. Um, and I think, you know, the crying is good. I think it's very well acted. I think as a storytelling device, there's a little bit of a shortcut taken there, mm. but like, I'll forgive it. Cause it's, you know, um, it's, they get where they need to go and they do so like, like 85 percent believably mm -hmm. but like that other 15 percent is me being like okay yeah andrew is crying because they need him to cry yeah um and like that's fine you have to do that sometimes and sure. again i think they got there mostly i just there was a little bit of me that resisted it just a touch i felt the same way i felt there was and again my big thing with this episode an episode again that i love um is why why is this episode about Andrew being a storyteller. Why is that sort of integral to what we need to get to at the end of this episode about him? Uh, it just, it seemed sort of sudden that we would have this narrative need for him to come to terms with kill, having killed Jonathan for the story to sort of move forward. And there was that, that I was just like, and again, it, it felt like we were just like, we're just going to like, again, take the shortcut to uh, to the ending and that's fine. And then we'll, you know, yada, yada, pass the seal and it's fine. Uh, but the other thing is why is, why does he make Buffy so mad is the other thing, which like this episode doesn't really require her to come to a realization of that. She never really has to sort of interrogate why he's bothering her so much. It, the episode kind of ultimately takes her side and is just sort of like as a given is just like well yeah like he should stop telling stories um but it did make that part made me think more than the andrew parts made me think because it's just like why does he bother her so much and and i was thinking of just that of all the characters everybody else sort of like feels a little flattered by andrew's attention and she feels exposed by it because I think this is the season where we always talk about like what's seasons as metaphors for like Buffy's stage in life. And season five was the rough transition to college. And uh, season six was, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, the friend group sort of uh, busting apart and, and her not really even wanting to be there anymore as in alive anymore. Mm -hmm. And Season seven felt like at some level or another, every season has a moment of Buffy not wanting to be the Slayer for one reason or another. And this one is mostly her being like, I hate the managerial aspects of being of what being the Slayer now is because I now have to like control this group of unruly children and be essentially just the field general for these guys. And it fucking sucks and I hate it so much and I feel like that's the part where her frustrations kind of come out in this it's just like no I don't want you to make a movie out of what I do for a living because I fucking hate what I do for a living right now so just like knock it off <laughs> and that at least got my sort of wheels churning a little bit during those scenes and, and yeah. I enjoyed that yeah I think this episode is really well handled on uh character level throughout and yeah. the plotting stuff is just a little bit a little bit janky but like i'll forgive that if the character stuff works i mean honestly like janice benson that's like her specialty i think like character work she mm -hmm. i always feel like her buffy episodes are like especially going through it for the podcast i even if i haven't looked up i'm like oh this is a janice benson episode like you you just can tell because she does character work so well and like character work with you know, we attribute a lot of it to Joss Whedon, but I think she's just as good with the dialogue and, you know, not an asshole, right? Like, <laughs> fun <laughs> bonus. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, I, 
Philip, how do you feel? I, I forgot. I, I need to ask you too. How did you feel about with Buffy like pretending to threaten Andrew? Um, I think Buffy hates gays and nerds. That's <laughs> why she can't stand him. She's like, right. get the faggot off the video camera. I am not watching that. I don't want to watch that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, um, <laughs> so I, I think I think I think Joe I think Joe is on something. I think she doesn't like being. Um, it's it's kind of like how she's always resisted, um, you know, having the watchers kind of oversight. She yeah. doesn't like being perceived. Um, <laughs> she's just like, I've got so much to do, and like, I don't have time for this. I, and and also like, especially in season seven, her her methods become increasingly ruthless. And I think you know, there's an awareness of that. So she doesn't want somebody like pointing a camera at her and shining a light on how much she has changed. Um, and I think that, yeah, if, if the, if the seal had required Andrew's blood, she would, um, have, you know, cut his pinky off and let him, you know, bleed out a little, just, just, just a little bit. Just a bit, just a bit. I, yeah, I mean, and the, the thing, so, okay, the reason I do like it is because I like, I mean, Anya points this out a couple of times, right? Like everyone like Willow and Spike get like kind of a free pass from Buffy. Everyone else, no. She like, you know, is annoyed at Anya, goes to kill her immediately. Um, but I like that Buffy does soften with him. The moment it like works and it shuts the seal, she does soften. And she goes back to like the Buffy that we love where she's like, I wasn't going to kill you. Like she kind of just is like, it's okay. Um, and isn't, like she still, of course, probably is finds him fucking annoying, but she's not like overly aggressive, and she is like softening and sweeter with him because like she's our hero, right? And she's got a, I don't know. That's what that's what I really do like about the scene is that she doesn't stay hard with him. She then is like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's fine, and he like does thank her. Almost, it's almost like a very aggressive, maybe not healthy form of therapy, right? <laughs> Actually, it's very close to trauma therapy. And now it's time for me to talk about my queer trauma for 25 minutes. <laughs> my therapist holds me over the mouth of hell and shakes my tears out. And that's how we get there. <laughs> I mean, it might work on me. I don't know. <laughs> if it was Sarah Michelle Geller, it probably would. <laughs> Worth a shot. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's yeah. try it. Everything else. Right. Um, <laughs> so and I do think uh, some people aren't good TV criers, but I do think this show, it has actors that all know how to or do a good cry. So I think Tom Lank does a like really good cry at the end here. Um, oh, yeah. There is like, it's not there and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you, you believe that this like, you know, nerd is crying and upset and like, I don't know. Yeah, he sells it. So then we cut to it's the end. The, the students all kind of just walk away from Robin and Spike, which I was like, I wish someone was like, Principal Wood, were you just hitting me? <laughs> like, what the fuck? Well, can we talk about the moment where Principal Wood almost stakes Spike and- Oh, yes. And would have if somebody didn't just sort of tackle him? I, I had forgotten about that moment and I liked how audacious it was where it's like, he doesn't have a change of heart. He doesn't hesitate. He would have done it. Yeah. And only really an accident of, you know, fate intervening made it so that he didn't. And I kind of like that because at the very least it was unambiguously like, oh yeah, like he's gonna, this he is the thing that you want him. for yeah. going forward. Like this guy really does want to, does want to get rid of this guy. And, and I, and I, I, I love, because they're like chest puffing gets very, I'm immediately tired of it. Like from the moment it happens. Yeah. But I love that Andrew is like, you could cut the sexual tension with this. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because also that's kind of how I'm like, either like Again, kill each other or fuck. I don't know. <laughs> he's the voice of the queer fan because we tend to see queer subtext a <laughs> lot of places. And so I like that too. It's just like gay. Like he just sort of looks at him and he's just like gay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We got it. Yeah. You, you saying you saying we tend to see queer subtext a lot of places uh, made me remember about five minutes ago when I was going to make an argument that Buffy is a trans girl. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, Emily, I, I think the time has come for you to, to present your argument to the group. <laughs> Hold on your PowerPoint. No, it was, it was uh, Ian said something that just made me be like, God, that's a trans girl mood. And then I was like, hmm. And, but I, I, you know, I think um, I think if you're going to pick a, a Buffy character who has sort of trans woman vibes, it's probably Willow, who has um, not just uh, the whole witchcraft thing, which works as a, a great metaphor for all sorts of queer woman experiences, but also dresses like a tragic trans lesbian. So. <laughs> Emily. <laughs> well, and transformed into Warren for a full episode. Yes, exactly. There we yeah, go. That is true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Emily. Um, if by Monday morning you could have this whole uh, presentation on my desk, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, and so I I do like the end too. I like we cut to just Andrew and he's like, Well, I killed my best friend. And he just sighs. Like, I liked that. Granted, I love Andrew as a character. I love his like whimsical. And we don't, you know, I'm glad that moving forward, it's not like he became so serious after this, but he was just kind of like still himself, but like being introspective. And I don't know, like we talk a lot about redemption, especially on this podcast, because, you know, so many of these characters, as they've made jokes about, have killed someone at some point. Yeah. And we do... It does seem sometimes like some characters, it's like, yeah, that's fine. And some characters, it's more like, no, you don't get a pass. Um, but with X-Men, I think of the same thing. Like, you know, how many times has Magneto joined the the fray and been a superhero and then betrayed them or Mystique or Sabretooth or whoever? Um, so in like fantasy and genre shows, I'm a little bit more like pliable with that shit um, than I would be in real life. But <laughs> I, they, 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 it worked for me. I felt bad for him at this end. Like I genuinely was like, man, I feel bad. Like I, I maybe, well, yeah, go ahead, Joe. One yeah. of the things, one of the things this season does actually pretty well is a lot of times when you talk about like redemption, characters have redemption arcs on shows and it mostly means they do a good thing. So they do such a good thing that in our minds, it sort of outbalances on the scale of the bad thing that they did. And what this season of Buffy does is it's not necessarily redemption, but there's a lot of atonement in this season, mm. right? Where like yeah. Willow atones for, it's not just that she does good things, but she like confronts the bad things that she did and she atones for it. And um, you see that with, even like in the context of like Xander and Anya's relationship. It's like Xander, you know, there's there's moments of atonement then with him, uh, with Anya. Anya herself and selfless uh, has stuff like that. Even when Faith comes back, there's not so much. Faith's got her own redemption arc that, you know, crosses over with Angel and stuff like that. But she and Buffy sort of have to come to their reckoning. And that's kind of a consistent theme that runs through this episode. And I think that's more than anything what ties this episode thematically to the season is... Andrew, Andrew's never going to be able to do anything so good that it's going to rebalance those scales as right. a moment of redemption. But it's this atonement where he looks, sort of like looks at what he did in the face and sort of, and it, it this is the moment where he kind of really joins the team, right? Up until this episode, he was sort of the, they would kind of knock him around and he, he was this obligatory thing where we've got Andrew in the house. And uh, Buffy, even in this episode, is just like, well, he's our hostage. Um, and in this one, it feels like, no, now Andrew's sort of turned that corner and yeah. he's now part of the team. Yeah, like which that. I do think is important to get there with him before we get to the yes. very end, right? Yes, yeah, totally. Because it also wouldn't have been fun if, like, in Chosen, they're still like, oh, stupid Andrew. Oh, but like, it just, we needed to move past. I that. like that he's there paired up with Anya in that episode. And I wouldn't have if they hadn't have done the work to sort yeah. of get him to that point. So um, I, <clears throat> Andrew fulfills a similar story function in season seven that 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 Clem did in season six, which is yeah. this, this new character that they're amused by who they can do a lot of different emotional tones. But Andrew, like, actually has a space to go and has emotional depth and can go on arcs um and i think that that is uh, a, a really a real strength of this season is that they're able to build his his storyline and i i'm not sure you know i'm probably jumping ahead slightly but i think the 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 thing that seals this episode for me is that last scene and his his performance there and the way that the episode just sort of ends on a half line mm -hmm. um i think it's really strong yeah yeah i like that's what works for me really well is like he just kind of says he killed his best friend and then sighs I it's 
you know, we got him admitting it to Buffy, but this is him kind of like thinking about it solo, which is also important, right? Like, I don't know. I, I did like it. Yeah. Uh, Philip, how does that last beat and uh, land for you? It's so it's exactly what Emily just said. It's the fact that he ends in the middle of a sentence, which is kind of, you know, if you want to talk about redemption, it's um, that's what Buffy tells Angel in amends. It's like it's not one thing. It's 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 something that's, you know, it's it's ongoing. It's continuous. Yeah. Um, it has Angel's whole deal. And also the fact that the entire episode has been about Andrew telling himself these neat, tidy little stories and actually, when it comes to telling the truth, he can't even get a full sentence out. He's like, I'm... And then it's literally just like, yeah, he, he, he kind of gives up. But I think he doesn't have a tidy answer for what comes next or, or what he should do. Yeah. Um, and it, yeah, it, it ends on like a surprisingly, like, you know, poignant note, given that the first, like, 40 minutes of this episode were pure comedy. Yeah. And now, with a fashion roundup of Storyteller, we have Season 7 costume designer Matt Van Dyne. Hello, Matt! Well, hi! Hi, everybody! I just keep wondering, aren't you guys sick of me yet? <laughs> Never! Oh, really? <laughs> really? Okay. All right. Uh, well, I'm, so, not, I'm not tired of you either, so... Oh, good, good. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you have for us for Storyteller? It's Andrew's big episode, Tom Link got his own episode of Buffy. Tom Link's big episode is right, <laughs> because in all of my um, notes and... Uh, my uh purchases it's 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 uh andrew 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 everything you know <laughs> it's like and and going backward you know of course we open up with uh you know him in the smoking jacket yeah and i can actually tell you that that came from palace costume that's where i bought or right. rented it excuse me I didn't buy it and that's funny and i even found where i got the ascot that he wears i rented that from tuxedo center <laughs> which made me laugh when i saw that so so yeah but yeah i have a lot of notes on him and a lot of purchases for him um i i, I was going through i have like uh his sneakers i i bought uh uh, Gordon Rush sneakers for him at Nordstrom for sixty nine ninety five. Uh, uh, those were blue suede. I bought green suede sneakers, the same sneaker sixty nine ninety five. Uh, Adidas uh, tennies in brown for seventy nine ninety five. All right. <laughs> a, a, assorted t shirts, sage green, gray, navy, all pure stuff for Andrew uh, from Nordstrom. And let's see, what else did I have for Andrew? Uh, uh oh i guess that was in the chem lab so when i'm watching that i'm like did i do that you know i'm like you know i didn't remember it and then going back when i was fortunate uh, fortunate enough to find my script i have the notes in my script that tell me well yeah i did do that and i <laughs> i thought was that a flashback i couldn't remember and then i found um some uh photos and you know the the boys being dressed mm -hmm. in the chem lab and i i so remember uh uh their fittings i remember them coming in because i suppose it was like um unusual to have all three of them there i suppose yeah, yeah. you know and i think that was why i remember it so well but i have like uh you know where i bought uh adam bush's warrants uh a a uh, button front shirt, four screen, uh, DKNY, that came from Nordstrom's, as well as a tan plaid shirt. I think that might be in the Kim lab. I'm not sure. One of okay. those. <laughs> and that was a Ben Sherman shirt for fifty nine fifty. 50 And uh, I have, uh, you know, notes on a robe I bought for uh, uh, Xander. I guess, was that in the beginning of the episode? Are they all in, when he's talking about what's going on, Oh, maybe. Guess, yeah, when they're all like, you know, congregating, you know, in the other room or something like that. I think, you know, but I, I think right. some people are in their jammies and all of that. And, and you know what I remember? I remember that uh, scene, the uh, the fantasy scene where, oh. you know, they're, it's everything's in slow-mo and all that. And I just think uh, Emma Caulfield, I, again, I just can't say enough good things about, <laughs> about her. I mean, she's funny. She's talented. She's beautiful to boot. Yeah. And she was just such a joy to dress. And I, I, I can see that. I, I couldn't find exactly where I um, purchased that 
outfit or you know what i how i came up with that but i imagine most of it came from Saks fifth avenue it looks yeah. like something Saks would carry because i care i i would buy a, a lot of her clothing a higher end stuff for her because mm. she was so beautiful to dress you know she just looked so pretty and and i yeah. i remember watching this the sleeves flutter in that you know in the in the in, in the breezy thing you know when she's <laughs> you, know, you know when she's uh in the fantasy i just thought oh that looks that looks really good i was i was pretty happy with that i do think her and sarah look really great in that scene yeah oh they do don't they? and sarah that's i think she isn't she wearing like a cream uh kind of uh flounce like bl- blouse you know, yeah, flowy, yes. yeah, yeah and i think i realize i think i know what that is it's uh it's a mark jacobs blouse that i got for her at neiman marcus mm. and uh, i think it was around mm, 230 dollars something like that okay. and then i have also for Sarah, something in the episode, a khaki jacket that she must, a Dolce and Gabbana. Uh, and I bought multiples of those. Uh, is that, I can't remember, is that in a cemetery or something? I'm not sure. Maybe. But, I, mean, I can't remember where she wears that one. Yes. Yeah. yeah and it was, it was $295. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, I bought, and I bought three of them, you know, for, for the nice. same people, you know. So, and uh, is that, let's see, in, in one of the scenes, Michelle Trachtenberg, she's wearing kind of a low cut purple uh, pullover. It looked like to me, mm. uh, and I thought, "Wow, that's really kind of low cut." <laughs> <laughs> and, but then I see the notes. It was a, uh, it was from it. It came from Saks. Actually, mm. Sarah's khaki jacket came from Saks. I thought it came from Neiman's, but it came from Saks. All okay. right. And uh, uh, Michelle's purple little top was by Joie which was a, a line that I used quite often on the show. Mm. And one thing that really stood out to me too, I, I have tons of notes about where I purchase things for uh, DB Woodside, Principal Wood. Mm. Uh, uh, but I really bought a very expensive black suit for him, uh, a Xenia suit, which was uh, $1,600. That was pretty, that was a big purchase, you know, oh. for out of well, my budget, my budget. And back, you said that most of the other suits he wore were rentals, right? Or just like stuff no, you had? no, no. They no? were they were um, purchased for him. His suits. Okay, okay. But I think what it was was I bought a wardrobe for him ah. uh, early on, and then uh, pulled from that wardrobe. You know, okay. of, like a closet, I guess you'd call it. You know, okay. his closet. Yeah. And I would, but, but this, for this episode, but I can't, I continue to buy quite a lot for him. And then of course, there's the famous scene, uh, which famous to me, but when they all are in their togas, the, oh, yeah. the three boys, you know, <laughs> scampering around in the field, which always makes me laugh. And I remember vividly fitting Danny strong for, oh, yeah? for that. I do. And Boy, has he done well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and I always get a kick out of that because I, I'm so happy for him because I, I think he's, you know, he does great work. And when, when I saw him the other day, I saw him on CNN. He was talking about some serious subject. I forget what it was. Hmm. But, but, uh, but I was, you know, I was so impressed with him. Uh, the good work that he does. And, you know, but I do remember him kind of laughing and giggling about, you know, wearing you right. know, the, the togas. And I, I see where I bought, I bought 25 yards of white fabric from F and S uh, fabrics over right. in, on, in Los Angeles. And I paid all of $202 for all of that fabric. But the, the real cost of doing that, that scene came in, uh, uh, with having to build it, you know, we, we made all. Of oh those. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. But then I laughed as I was looking on my notes, I, I rented sandals from three different uh, costume houses. So I don't know if I was trying to find the right size for each of the boys, but some mm. of them were returned, but you know, I, I rented sandals from Western costume from uh, the costume rentals uh, collection, CRC and United Costumes as well. And Warner and Warner Brothers. Now I, I did make a note where all the ones from Warner Brothers were returned uh just restocking because we didn't <laughs> use any of those. So I'm not sure why, but we didn't. And then I did laugh at the scene where um is Andrew and uh 
Danny's character, Jonathan, is that his mm-hmm. character? Yeah. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're in the bed in the hacienda. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think it's uh, who was wearing, oh, I think it's Andrew's wearing the Tommy Bahama. Yeah. Uh, shirt from Nordstrom's. I have that. I have a note on that. And I also <laughs> have a note on, on where I purchased his black wingtips for the scene in the chemistry lab. And that, that also came from Nordstrom, Nordstrom's. <laughs> Those were $110. But but just that tank top uh, or the or the wife beater, I should say, in mm. on uh, Danny Strong, uh, that just made me laugh. I thought, well, that was a nice touch. I thought that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that worked out pretty well. It, it, it lended a lot of comedy to that scene, I thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, then I know, and then I have a note where I purchased some uh, uh, Calvin Klein tank tops for Spike. Uh, mm-hmm. Two of those. Uh, those came from Macy's. And another suit for Principal Wood, uh, gray pinstripe, it says, Calvin Klein. Right. I, bought, I bought two of those at Macy's. So we must have had a stunt scene there. But yeah, but that, but that episode, I thought, it, I just think it's a charming episode, you know? It and, is. It's, and it's written so well by Jane. I mean, the, yeah. ending, the ending is beautiful, you know, where she's, where, Buffy Sarah says no I wasn't going to kill you but yeah. you know but it's just so and and uh Tom just did a wonderful job in in uh that whole episode I mean especially you know the conclusion I just thought yeah you know his uh his full circle you know of you know owning you know what he did and all of that I thought that, I thought it was just a great episode and I, I'm happy to say when I review these i haven't looked at them in years many 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 years <laughs> and i think i just kind of fast forwarded through a few of them uh when i was doing one of the conventions because i i just didn't have time right. to sit, sit through all of them but th- for this i am taking the time and watching and and appreciating them so much and it, it is very gratifying to look back at something uh that um continues to uh, be uh, relevant to so many people and and was done so well by so many people who worked on the show, my crew and every 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 department on the show. It's, it shows uh, when I watch it. I think I, I'm very proud to have been a part of it. Nice, I love that, Matt. Yeah, it's you know I I yeah the show. There's a reason it's still popular, right? You know this many. There years is. Ago. There really is, and. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I just watch, I have to say, I just watch Sarah, who is so evolved yeah. for such a young age. Yeah. And it's uh, it's kind of thrilling to watch that. And it, all of the actors, actually, I mean, they're just so charming, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it, it was, I think, uh, I just want to say one more thing about that, because of how he defined them and the writers defined them. It makes a job like mine so much easier because you go, oh, I know what that person would wear. I know what that person would want. I know, meaning their character more than right. the act, more than the actor. But but yeah. sometimes you have to you have to you know uh, accommodate the actor, of course, as well. So right. But, but it was um, I look back at it and uh, have really good feelings about it. So oh, nice. Okay. Wait, I, I do have one question for you. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Is, is, making a, is making a toga something like that, is something like that super easy for you? Or is that like a pain in the ass? <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't that difficult, really. The, 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 the most um, labor intensive part was finding the pieces to assemble, like the grapes and spray painting the uh, yeah. gold and all of that. Because, <laughs> you know, that's what we did. You know, I, I would, you know, go shop for you know, things that, uh, there's a place I imagine I bought them at Moscatel's, which is downtown mm. Los Angeles, which has all kinds of, you know, fake fruit and things yeah. like that, you know, and, you know, creating that. But, uh, but I want to, uh, to, uh, give credit to, to, uh, my, uh, uh, cutter fitter stitcher, uh, Shirley Lipscomb who helped, uh, create those. So, yes. so that was, but yeah, that was just, something that we had a heads up on and uh, we had time to do it because they sent out basically a teaser telling me that, you know, this is what's going to be coming up in the next episode. So, right. 
So that gives you kind of an idea ahead of time, you know, that that you're going to be um, creating something like that. Right. Which yeah. I think I think it looks so funny in the episode. And then, you know, yeah. uh, cut to what was it like a couple of years ago? A coloring book comes out, and that's one of the <laughs> <laughs> scenes in the coloring book. It always makes me laugh. I thought, oh, that's great. That's great. It is a. It's a. It's like an iconic scene, but also like really fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. It really is. It truly is. All right. Well, cool. Thank you for joining us, Matt. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And now I have joining me a very special guest, writer of Storyteller, Jaina Spenson. Hello, Jane. Hey, hello. It's so nice to have you back. I'm happy to be here and talking <laughs> about one of my faves. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's get into it. Tell me what made y'all want to do an uh, Andrew-centric episode? Well... Remember, this this whole thing is very top-down. So as an individual yeah. writer on a show, it's actually very rare that you would be driving, the driving impetus for a story. So I was just a passenger <laughs> in this lovely journey um, and, until they sort of, you know, sent me out to start writing. Um, but this is my favorite kind of episode. I'd already done Superstar. Oh, really? So, um, <laughs> Oh, yeah. To take a tertiary character and say everybody's the hero of their own story. Nobody's a tertiary character in real life. Mm -hmm. Look, you can you can point at any character in a group scene and dive into their worldview and you'll find something rich. That. Oh, my God. That's my favorite thing. Uh, and maybe having already done uh, <laughs> done Superstar, I was I was the natural pick for this. Or maybe it was just my turn up in the rotation. I don't yeah. remember. Um, but I have a vague memory <laughs> that maybe somebody came to my office door and said, we've got a story for you. Maybe I'm making that up, but, um, <laughs> but it, it was a good fit for me. I mean, to be honest, I, I feel like you are the perfect fit to write Andrew because in these episodes, these Buffy episodes that you write are very, yours for me are some of the more standout ones where it's like, oh, I bet Jane Spencer wrote this one. Um, and it feels like Andrew is the perfect character for you to write. Like, it seems like a character you would have fun writing. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, he's right, right, right in my sweet zone or whatever it's called. <laughs> what are the, what are the baseball people call it? Uh, <laughs> he's exactly the kind of whimsical character I love, a character that's going to use elevated language or heightened language and, and yeah, has whimsy about him. And that's just absolutely my favorite. Yeah, I feel like that's, you, that is your specialty, right? Like a, a character who you can still take seriously, but still has like comedic timing and is still like m takes himself seriously, but not too seriously and still is like making jokes about everything going on. Uh, that's kind of where you like, I mean, you always shine, duh, but that's your. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that, that really gets to it. Some, something you said about they don't take themselves seriously. It's like, but we need to take them seriously. Like a character who it's easy yes. to take lightly and then you realize, oh no, there, there's more there. That's, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, did, you, did you know first or did Tom know first? Like who knew first about Andrew getting his own episode? Oh, it was probably me. It would be, it would be unusual for the actor to know. Usually they find out many weeks after, after they've been picked out for, for an episode. I think. I mean, that that seems to be my experience. <laughs> I gotta <laughs> ask, when did you all realize what great chemistry Tom Lank and Emma Caulfield had? <laughs> oh, that must have been something that got noticed on set. Um, uh, and it probably was noticed as soon as they did, uh, as soon as they were in an episode together. Um, yeah, they were <laughs> fantastic together. Uh, and they and they conclude their stories together in the in the series finale. Um, uh, it's just poetic. Um, but I, in terms of understanding when Tom, that Tom was as magical as he was, that was um, at his audition. Uh, it's a story that's been told many times, but in case people haven't heard it, Doug <laughs> Petrie was sent to go to the auditions for Andrew, and he came back from those auditions going. 
what if we went a totally different way? Because this guy, Tom Link, came into audition and it is not at all what we wrote, but it's what this character should be and needs to be. Oh, I love that. I didn't know that. Um, that makes sense because, yeah, he he really does embody Andrew. And knowing Tom, he's he's a lot like Andrew, but just way less nerdy. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, he's given him heightened versions of his own mannerisms, which I just love. Uh, nobody does awkward like Tom. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so you kind of had him, I, I was rewatching this morning, and I was thinking how weird it is that this predated, like, capital Y YouTubers, but it's almost like he was like a predecessor to like social media folks mm-hmm. with what he's doing. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. It it, it did then uh, become manifest, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it's you're to blame for that, Jane. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about uh, the, the thing specifically I kept thinking of, which does feel very you. How did you come up with the bit, the like, I mean, the flashbacks of like Andrew kind of exaggerating slash completely make, rewriting history makes sense, but I love the we are as gods bit. Like, how did you come up with that? <laughs> I don't remember. I Most things in on Buffy came out of the room and, and, and I was, you know, handed the, the idea for the scene. And the only thing I can, you know, specifically point at is like specific turns of phrase and stuff uh, that were mine. Um, so I believe that I was probably handed the idea that they're capering, Uh, singing We Are As Gods. Cool thing about it, though, um, is that since, you know, I just, I wrote the lyrics, We Are As God, Tom figured out a little tune to sing them to. And then very unusually, Tom didn't sign the little waiver that would say he's not going to ask for um, songwriting credit on it. So I didn't either. And we share songwriting credit on We Are As Gods and we're both ASCAP members. Like we're like legit, like legit songwriters as a result. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I've made like half a penny off it. <laughs> um, I also love the bit because um, Spike tends to take himself more seriously and you wrote the bit of Spike like being dramatic, throwing the cigarette, and then Andrew is like, oh, the lighting wasn't good. Can we redo that? And Spike immediately does that. I thought that was a very genius <laughs> look at Spike because it <laughs> does make sense, right? <laughs> right, absolutely. Uh, and particularly when you know Spike's backstory uh, and you go like, oh, well, he was sort of always, this was an image he put on himself at the very beginning. Um, and I think... Everybody is sort of, you know, every various characters in the story get flattered by by Andrew. Uh, and, you know, oh, I'll get a close up, I'll get a key light, I'll get my own segment. Like everybody is, um, everybody is flattered by attention and uh, uh, impressed by show business. And everybody wants to do what Andrew's doing here, <laughs> which is tell their story in the most flattering way they can. Yeah, I, you know, I love the bit of when Andrew's like going to do the video intros and at first Amanda's standing there and she gets so excited and he's like, no, 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 not you, sweetheart. Just the like main characters. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, he's doing to her what the whole viewership's been doing to Andrew the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, so it is Andrew's episode, but I got to ask, um, with the Xander and Anya stuff, they do kind of have like the... B or C plot here of kind of reconciling, but not um, where I was curious what you were, what were the, like maybe the writer's room in general trying to go for with Xander and Anya at this point? Um, Because I, I'm always team Anya in the fight about, you know, him leaving her. I'm always team Anya, but I do like their discussion (laughs) and you bring the nuance to like, well, it wasn't the best decision, but it was the right decision. Like, I don't know. I what. How do you, how do you, where do you fall in all that? Um, this is a, fra- I'm afraid a lost in the mists of time situation. I don't recall. Um, I look at it now as if someone else wrote those parts. And I think any situation that's been left unresolved in a story 
can if it's a well to told story with really deep characters, you can always go back and look at it and rehash it and ask the question: Is this resolved? And was the it was this? Did this character do the right thing, the wrong thing? Is this relationship over and not over? I just think in general, uh, it's wonderful to be on a show where there it has that kind of depth where you can examine any choice psychologically. So I just love that, but I, I no longer remember the, 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 in, in my great personal detail what I thought or felt about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got to ask, what was there a moment you either wrote that didn't make it in or a moment you wished you could have had in this episode that you didn't? There was a thing. I was just rereading the original script and I, I can tell it's not the final script because it's got some lines in it that, that aren't in the final and vice versa. And um, there was a thing and I don't I was I was trying to rewatch it, but I was getting distracted. There's a bit I wrote in the original vampire fight, um, which we're seeing sort of a, a heightened version of that fight. Buffy is like she does a handstand, all that stuff. Yeah. And it's because it's it's Andrew's sort of heightened version of it in the script. I had her kick a stake through a vampire. She throws a stake in the air. She <laughs> kicks it into a vampire's chest. And I don't think it's in the fight as filmed and aired. And I'm like, oh, what a missed opportunity. I would have loved to see that. <laughs> that would have been really cool. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, what was what's your favorite scene in the episode? Like, what do you think, you know, you're writing and Tom's acting. Like, what would be your favorite uh, scene that came, that was filmed? Oh, I like a lot of it. I like the Masterpiece Theater opening. I think Tom's hilarious there. He came up with Vampire and Cruel. The wind was Cruel. Um, and all that stuff. And I just, that's, I was on set when he was filming that. And I just couldn't believe how glorious it was. Uh, and he really was genuinely getting green from having to puff on the pipe. He was like, I can't do that one more time. <laughs> um, so I love that. I think I love all the, the flashbacks to the trio, the, the um, we'll make her magnetic, but things will stick to our belt buckles in my plan. We are beltless. I like that a lot. That, that just cracks me up. And Andrew and Jonathan in, in Mexico, um, all those flashbacks. Uh, I love those. Um, the, the guys, those guys are just so funny. You know, it's funny. I can tell that you had a lot of fun writing the trio and it seems like you have a lot of fun with them and you do fun things with these characters that, you know, like realistically weren't fun villains were, you know, pretty evil, but you do, you do make them really fun. And I can right. tell that you have fun with them. Yeah. They're fun. I mean, yeah, I know they did. They did terrible things. They are, they were the incels before that term came along. They're, they're not good guys. Yeah. Um, but uh, there was some redemption. And um, uh, they're, they're so ridiculous. Characters like that should be laughed at. Um, and I think yeah. that's the most positive way to, to respond to them. is Because for them, that's the worst thing that could happen, uh, is to be laughed at. And, and, and that's what they're earning when they're, when they're being terrible. And I got to ask you this, uh, you know, I know some fans think about like Andrew's redemption. What do you feel about Andrew's redemption? Do you think it's earned? Do you think, you know, it's mostly Tom Lang's charm? Like, where do you fall on that? <laughs> A lot of everything is Tom Lang's charm. Um, <laughs> I think... I think a good case can be made for his redemption. He's there in the big final fight. Uh, and this episode... He's forced to face what he's been doing the whole time, which is telling himself a story that makes him look good. Um, telling everything is a story. Um, you know, making people into black and white heroes and villains. Um, and he's confronted with it here. And that I think if he hadn't been... You could say he hasn't earned it. He hasn't been forced to look at what he's done. But here he kind of, he's at least forced to look at his, at, at the way he frames his worldview. And I think that's that's important. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, I mean, a lot could be said for, you know, uh, in X-Men, what villain hasn't joined the team for a brief period of time or gone good for good, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I think those, the rules apply a little differently when you're telling, like, you know, sci-fi supernatural type stories. 
We are telling a story. That's right. And and I yeah. wouldn't apply everything you've learned from Buffy. There are, there are big good lessons to apply from Buffy, but it is also a heightened universe with archetypes and things that, that, that real life is, is so much more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, that's kind of my, my argument with a lot of things in like genre. Cause you got, you know, uh, I think of WandaVision when people are like, Oh, she's the villain. She's a villain. And it's like, yeah, but like you can't apply real world rules to like a witch who can create her own world. Right. Like, <laughs> right. Right. All right, Jane. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this and giving us a little behind the scenes on Storyteller. It's always a pleasure having you. It's always a pleasure visiting with you. This is so much fun. And and uh, I wanted to mention fans of Tom Lank, if you ever get a chance to see him in the play, Tilda Swinton answers an ad on Craigslist. Jump at the chance. He's awesome in it. It's one of the funniest things I've ever seen. And again, Ian, thank you so much. <laughs> this is always so much fun. Thank you, Jane. And we'll see you next time. Bye. All right. And now we're going to give our final closing remarks. Favorite outfit of the episode, Joe. All right. So this is kind of niche. I know you guys are going to come with like the good ones and I'm going to have the dorky one. All right. There's an extra in the high school who, (laughs) when they're all running around, he sort of crosses the screen and he's wearing one of those sort of... um, late 90s early 2000s sort of like uh not quite it's sort of a sweater but it's like one of those sort of like lightweight sweaters with the like triple stripe that goes up the one sleeve and across the chest and down the other sleeve which i had that as i say i definitely own shirts like that yeah (laughs) i owned a lot of those but i had one in like i'm pretty sure like that exact color and i sort of like leonardo dicaprio and once upon a time in hollywood sort of like (laughs) pointed the screen it was like that one um i swear to god i've talked about this particular garment type of garment before i hope it was not on this podcast (laughs) if you've heard me talk about this type of sweater sweater before on this podcast before no you didn't um that stood out to me more than anything else. I was just like, oh, right, like early 2000s fashion. God, how I missed you. Um, I could feel the like the hair gel in my hair sort of like spiking up my my hair as I as I watched it. I was just like transforming back into my early 20s self. Um, but anyway, yeah, that was my that was my pick. Emily. Oh, God, I, I'm I'm not someone who who pays a ton of attention to fashion. Um, so. Uh... I feel like shampoo commercial Buffy, which is what I'm going to describe her as in that, that fantasy sequence is very much who I wanted to look like in 2003. <laughs> I mean, she looks great. So she looks amazing. Yes. <laughs> um, all right, Philip. Yeah, it's not an amazing episode for clothes. I, I, you know, whenever I rewatch um, for this podcast, I always, have an eye out for the outfits uh, um and i mean yeah so buffy looks amazing in that um shampoo commercial uh and, and, and she wears that blouse for the entire episode it's really rare that buffy only has like one outfit for an entire 45 minutes yeah um but i think i'm gonna go with anya in that little red number i, I something they do with anya quite a lot that i really enjoy i know that the um, the costume designer matt van dyne has said that they have a lot of fun dressing yeah. Emma Caulfield is they, they go a little bit pin up and a little bit old Hollywood with her, with the way they style her hair with sort of the little, some, some of the, the little cardigans and, and, and clothes. It's, it's, it's all just like a quite classic. Um, like what, I, I mean, specifically like the, um, I'll never tell like right, yeah, yeah. ginger Rogers number. Uh, it's very, it's very that. And they, they sort of harken back to that. Um, in this episode, which is fun because it's again, it's another fourth wall breaking moment in the show. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go with like the the cute little curls and the the red um, outfit. Okay, okay. I think, I mean, I, I'm I'm with you, Emily. I Buffy with that. I think that flowy top that has like some flowers on it is cute, yeah. and she looks her hair looks great. Um, and I actually liked it even better at the end when she puts on like that like beige colored blazer on top yeah. of it. I think she looks great. Yeah. Um, yeah. favorite scene, Emily. Um, I do love, I do love that. I mean, I, we've, we've talked about a lot of them. I do love that last scene though. I think that's a, a, 
I don't know. I think that's a really strong choice to end an episode on. I think he uh, gives a really good performance in that little moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Philip? I'm going to cheat a little bit. And I'm going to say the scenes that bookend the episode. So the hyper stylized pastiche within the armchair with the fireplace Mm -hmm. going, you know, and then skipping straight to the end where it's like, he's literally sat in a bathroom, um, just talking to a camera, like all of the artifice has crumbled away. Um, It's a really nice one, two punch when you look at how the episode starts and ends. So I'm going to say those two moments. Joe Reed. Those are all good ones. Um, mine is uh, inserting uh, Andrew into the scenes with Dark Willow. I, I just thought it's so clever and so uh, so funny, so well done. I think my favorite is, I, I, it's the opening. I love the like Masterpiece Theater opening. I just love it. Yeah. Um, it's fun. And I love that it's like cut with Anya saying, why can't you masturbate with like the rest of us? I just think that's A+. plus. Um, yeah. What grade do we give the episode, Philip? Um... <laughs> So, as Emily has pointed out, the episode is both amazing, but also very bad in that uh, (laughs) there is no plot. They're like, there's something about the seal, and that's just sort of like, oh, we're going to have to come up with some some pretext that then, you know, kind of brings about this whole structural fun we're going to have with it. Um, So, I'm going to say for just because, like, what it does well, it does fantastically, I'm going to say, like, a an A minus. It almost doesn't matter that there's no plot because the character details and the humor are the show just like firing all cylinders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Joe? Yeah, I spent most of the episode sort of mentally comparing this to Superstar because they are so similar and because they're both Jane Espenson episodes. And I think Superstar succeeds a little bit more because that episode it is allowed to be totally standalone completely separate from that season's story arc whereas i think the moments where storyteller has to fit into the larger season seven arc kind of weakens it a bit i think as an overall buffy episode i'm probably gonna go b plus but as a season seven episode it's one of my top five season seven episodes so i'd say like a a minus almost an a for uh for, for as a season seven episode all right emily um were i grading this show at the av club my former home at the time i probably i probably would have given it an a i think it's a standout in season seven it, it is what i i was telling my wife it used to be in my top 10 episodes of the show i don't think it is anymore but it, it's in the top quarter for me right. um i i think it's a really strong episode like a, realistically a minus is probably the right grade but i'm i'm happy giving it an a on the strength of some of the the conceptual ideas and and tom lake's performance emily how much PTSD does having to give TV episodes letter grades give you at this point? Uh, you know what? The the secret sauce of the AV Club was everything was either a B plus or an A minus. <laughs> <laughs> the two grades you could give where people would be like, yeah, sure, fine. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I give it an A. Um, yeah, I definitely think it's one of the standout season seven episodes, but I actually do. I would say it's superior to Superstar in the fact that it does fit in the plot because Superstar for me was a little too too outside. Like I just felt like, eh, do I care? Yeah. Um, right. And this was like, I do care. I've, um, always, I've always preferred this to Superstar. I, I, I have yeah. to say that. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for listening. If you like Slayer Fest 98, you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also support us on Patreon. We are going to be starting soon, Harley Quinn Season 2, and going through that for the Patreon. I'm also going through the rest of Buffy Season 7 with my mom over there. And you can get access to our sex sex positive talk videos, my nudie Judy that I do with Zachary Patton Garcia. And uh, the support is much appreciated. If you want to find us on social, we are at SlayerFestX98 on all platforms, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. And uh, if you want to follow me, I am at Ian X Carlos on all social media platforms. Emily, where can everyone find you? I realized I introduced myself as as Emily Vandor at the start of this episode. I'm so used to it. I'm, I'm slowly transitioning to my new name, Emily St. James. So I'm going to okay. just say... I started this podcast as <laughs> and of course the cross of it, I became a new person. Um, no, I'm, I'm Emily St. James. You can find me 
on Twitter at twitter.com slash EmilyVDW. My writing appears at Vox. I have a newsletter on uh, Letterdrop at emilyvdw.letterdrop.com. That is both my writing and the writing of several freelancers. Um, and uh, I also make the podcast Arden, which is about two women who solve uh, cold cases and try not to fall in love. And also kind of about how every Shakespeare play is about how hard it is to be a teen girl in America. You can find <laughs> it on podcast, uh, podcast catchers everywhere. Cool. And Joe, where can everyone find you? Oh, sure. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Joe Reed. Reed is R-E-I-D. Um, I'm at primetimer.com, where, like I said, I am a managing editor and writer there. And if you are into uh, the Oscars at all as a thing, uh, I co-host a podcast called This Had Oscar Buzz with my friend Chris File. And that is on all, all your great uh, podcasting platforms. This Had Oscar Buzz. Joe, Joe, have you ever done Bicentennial Man on that show? I haven't listened to all the episodes. We can't because- Oh, because it was nominated for makeup. Oh, God. Yes. It's God. one of the great, there are like five movies that I'm furious we can't do. One of them is The Lovely Bones. One of them is Charlie Wilson's War. And one of them is definitely Bicentennial Man. I'm so, so upset. Yes. Well, listen, listen, this is this is me putting you on the spot. Ha- have me on the show. We'll talk about not Bicentennial okay. Man. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll just talk about Bicentennial Man at the end. We'll just be like, we'll pretend that we just discovered that it got us. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Philip, where can everyone find you? <laughs> Uh, you can find me covering the really important stuff like celebrity thirst traps um, and gay feelings at menshealth.com. Um, and you can find me having lots of gay feelings um, on Twitter at Philip underscore Ellis. That's Philip with one L and Ellis with two. All right, everyone. And thank you so much. We will see you next time for uh, Lies My Parents Told Me. Bye. <laughs>